Hey everyone and welcome to my second and final limited review video for Eternal Masters. I already posted my picks for the best commons and uncommons in each color, and in this video we will be going a little bit more in depth talking about the various archetypes of the format. This format has 10 archetypes of color pairs, um, and we're going to look at each of these color pairs and talk about the key commons and uncommons for each of them. In this video, I won't generally be talking about things like removal spells, which are good in basically any deck, and instead we'll focus on synergies that exist within the specific color pairs I'm talking about. We will mostly focus on commons and uncommons for each archetype, although I will include a few rares for each as well. This video will be a bit long, so you can find timestamps in the description below so you can skip around easily. So let's not waste any more time and get started. The first archetype we're going to look at is green-white enchantments. And the last few years, Wizards has adopted the practice of including these signposts on commons and limited formats to help guide players towards what the archetype is supposed to be for that particular color pair. These gold cards are always powerful, provided you're in the two colors they ask for. And for each color pair in this format, as in many, there, I'll be showing you guys uh, the signpost uncommon first and discussing what the archetype is. Then I'll discuss the key cards for each archetype. We will begin with green-white, where the signpost uncommon is our armadillo cloak, which you see here. And the archetype we have here is green-white enchantments. Green and white have tons of quality enchantments to play, such as this armadillo cloak, which is a pretty beastly aura. And it also has some enchantment payoffs. First, we will talk about enchantment payoffs at common and uncommon in this color pair. So there are five cards at Common and Uncommon that give you payoffs for playing lots of enchantments. And the order I have them in here is the order I value each of them in this specific archetype. First, we have Mesa Enchantress. She is a big part of an enchantment deck being good because turning all of your enchantments into cantrips makes basically any enchantment in the format playable. If you see Mesa Enchantresses around late, it is probably a good idea to take them and try to make a green-white enchantment decks work. Uh, second, we have another Enchantress, not quite as good, but still pretty good, Yavimaya Enchantress. She can be quite beastly in a deck that is running enchantments as removal spells and is running a bunch of auras, and it is worth noting that she gets buffed by your opponent's enchantments too, so she's usually going to be quite large in this deck, and it's great that she's at, at common, so it won't be that hard for this deck to pick up a couple of them. Most other decks aren't going to be interested in running her. At number three, we have another uncommon, and that is Ancestral Mask. This card isn't quite as good here as it is in Popper and other formats where you can put it on a creature with Hexproof. There's not a single creature in this set with Hexproof, really. Not at Common and Uncommon anyway. Um, but it's still a good card to play when your opponent is tapped out and makes you swing for a lot of damage if you've really gotten there on the enchantment deck. Next, I have Monk Idealist. This card is probably only really needed as a one-of in a good enchantment deck, but being able to get back your good auras or removal spells uh, is pretty good. Last, we have a card with minor enchantment payoff that this deck doesn't always need, though it does pair well with Monk Idealist, and that is Commune with the Gods. If you're digging for one particularly powerful enchantment in your deck, this is a good way to do it. Unlike the other cards in this list, though, Commune with the Gods will also be sought after by people playing the Blue-Green Threshold deck, where it is likely better that... What, there, it's better than it is in this deck. The Blue-Green Threshold deck will want it more. So let's look at some of the enchantments at Common and Uncommon in Eternal Masters that make this archetype worth going into. There are a lot of good enchantments at Green and White that go well with the enchantment payoffs I just discussed. Once again, I have the cards listed in order, although for this list we don't look at synergy so much as raw power. We already discussed the main synergy cards. I think the most powerful common or uncommon enchantment in this format is Pacifism. It is strong in any deck, so there will be a lot of competition for it, even though it is at at its best in your deck, where it will turn into a cantrip and have other effects. Next is Faith's Fetters, another card that will be highly sought after by basically all decks, but again, it will be at its best in your deck. Third is Ranker, which I think other decks will be interested in, but not as much as they are in the first two. This is a card that's really there. It's really there for the green-white enchantment deck. It's great because it not only buffs one of your creatures and gives them a neat evasive ability, it also keeps coming back, so if you have triggers uh, like... Mesa Enchantress, you get to draw cards over and over again. Then we have another powerful aura, Elephant Guide, which pumps a guy and doesn't two-for-one you because it gives you an elephant if the creature it's attached to dies. And then we have our last enchantment-based removal spell, which is Roots. A root isn't amazing at all. It is clunky and restrictive, but it deals with creatures and has great synergy with the cards we just looked at. Next, we have Abundant Growth. This thing cantrips already, so it has that going for it. It can also enable an easy splash, making it a solid card for this archetype. Next, we have the two Hondans in these colors. The white one, Hondan of Cleansing Fire, and the green one, Hondan of Life's Web. I think a deck with several abundant growths 
Could probably play the other Hondans as well, which would be a pretty sweet deck, but I'm only including the green and white ones here as they are in the base colors of the deck. If you get one of each, you should probably play them both in a deck with enough enchantment payoffs, but one of each might not quite be good enough, though the Cleansing Fire is probably not a bad sideboard card against aggro decks. Lastly, I have Field of Souls. It's an interesting card, but I'm not sure this is really the deck for it. If you end up with several creatures, though, and are still a green-white enchantment deck, you should probably go for it because it replaces every one of your creatures with a spirit, which is definitely worth it. But this deck isn't always going to be the most creature-heavy deck. It's usually just going to have a few threats like the Yavimaya Enchantress and so forth. Um, there's also rares and mythics that play well in this particular archetype. Um, if you're already in the green-white deck, they are pretty high picks in the subsequent packs. And honestly, if I open an Argothian Enchantress pick one, uh, I find it very difficult to believe that I wouldn't take it and try to make the archetype work. She's better than Mesa Enchantress, obviously, because she has Shroud. She's very difficult to deal with in this format. There's not a huge, there are a couple sweepers, but they're rare. Um, and she's just very difficult to deal with. Although I guess she dies to nausea too, doesn't she? But still, I would try to make it happen. Sylvan Library is first pickable in basically any situation, but it's especially amazing in this deck where you get bonuses for enchantments. Enlightened Tutor is something that you'll probably be able to get a little bit later if no one else at the table is in the deck. Um, it's great because it can find you whatever you need, whether it's an aura to help win you the game or an aura to deal with a problem creature. And finally, there's Glare of Subduel, which is, again, it's sort of like, uh, you know, you have to have a certain number of creatures in your deck to make it work. Um, and this deck isn't always going to have those, but sometimes it will have enough creatures that you want to be running Glare of Subduel. And you do want to have some creatures in this deck um, because you want to be putting Rancor and Elephant Guide on things. But uh, this deck, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it has 10 to 12 creatures or something like that most of the time, as opposed to 15, 16, where Glare of Subduel gets really good. So that does it for green-white. Let's go ahead and move on to the next archetype, which is blue-white. As is pretty typical for blue-white, Skies is the archetype. This time, though, there are several payoffs for playing Flyers instead of just a few. Uh, our signpost uncommon was the signpost uncommon in Magic Origins as well, and that is Thunderclap Wyvern. He enabled some pretty strong Skies decks there and is a great card for you if you're in the archetype. Um, he's amazing because he has Flash, already a 4-mana 2-3 flyer with Flash is playable, but then he's a Flying Lord and pumps all the rest of your flyers, meaning that your army gets very scary and very strong uh, and very quickly, and your opponent isn't always going to expect it because this guy has Flash. So... First, we're going to talk about some of the payoffs for playing a bunch of flyers in addition to Thunderclap Wyvern. I once again have the cards here in order of how important I think they are for the archetype. Um, there are four flying payoffs at common and uncommon counting Thunderclap Wyvern, but it's worth remembering that synergy is pretty easy in an archetype like this, as any creature with flying fits right in. The non-Thunderclap Wyvern card that I think is the most powerful in this archetype is Sprite Noble. Uh, she's another flying lord. She pumps all their toughness, and she can pump their power too if she taps. So imagine having Thunderclap Wyvern and Sprite Noble together. That's a pretty scary thing to either be facing down or pretty awesome if you're the one who's playing it. Um, Warden of Evos Isle is a great common for this deck. Windrake is always playable already, and this one then makes the rest of your creatures cheaper, at least the rest of your flying creatures, which is great. Uh, last is Soulcatcher, who I think is good, kind of a very narrow Unruly Mob with flying, though it is worth noting it counts the death of opponent's creatures too, which Unruly Mob does not, um, but they do have to have flying. But it isn't as exciting as the two blue cards or the Thunderclap Wyvern. Uh, it'll also be a card you can pick up pretty easily because no one but the blue-white deck is really going to want Soulcatcher. The other two could find themselves played elsewhere just for being efficient flyers with a bit of upside. So now we'll just talk about the creatures with flying in the format, other than those that I already mentioned. And I will list them in order of how strong I think they are in this archetype, uh, generally how good of a finisher they are for the most part. Jetting Glass Kite is a first pickable card, I think, um, if a pack has no premium removal, because it provides a 4-4 flyer for a reasonable cost of 6 mana, while also being incredibly difficult to deal with outside of combat. It needs to be targeted by at least two spells or abilities in a turn to kill it, and that's not an, always an easy thing to do in Limited. Sometimes it's not in Constructed either, that's why Kira Great Glass Spinner sees play. This is sort of the, you know, big brother of Kira Great Glass Spinner, who's not quite as good, but uh, it's much larger, so it has that going for it. Uh, and then we have Sarah Angel, who's, you know, been dropped to an uncommon. She used to be, you know, a rare, a very good finisher and constructed. She's not that anymore, but she's still a very strong limited card. Five mana, four, four, with flying and vigilance is amazing. Um, she's very strong for a blue-white skies deck. She can do offense and defense. If you then have the other things in play that allow you to pump her, she gets even more amazing. Or if you pay her for one less mana, for example. Like, if you play her on turn four after a turn three Warden of Evosile, that is some amazing value. Um, 
Next, we have Peregrine Drake, who is a below-rate flyer, but the fact that he allows you to, say, play him and then Sarah Angel in the same turn is pretty sweet. Um, you know, he just allows you to play two spells in one turn when you normally would not be able to. Um, and, he, you know, four, five mana for a 2-3 flyer is an amazing, but the upside that this card has is pretty good, um, despite the fact that he's a below-rate flyer. Um, it's also nice for leaving mana up for removal and so forth. Next, I have Avon Rift Watcher. It might have Vanishing, but it can easily provide an 8-point life swing because it hits your opponent for 4 and gains you 4 life in the process. That amount of a life swing is huge. That makes the Avon Rift Watcher a very good card for this deck, I think. It's good for really any aggressive deck in this format, though. Um, next, we have a vanilla card in Phantom Monster, but he's a decent raid for a 3-3 flyer, especially if you have the flying payoffs. Uh, Mistral Charger is similar, a 2-mana two 2-1 two with flying, so again, vanilla, but... You know, it's a very efficient flyer already, and then if you have flying playoffs, it gets a much better. Um, next, we have Welkin Guide. It's probably actually at its best in a deck that doesn't quite get enough flyers into it or has some big bruisers on the ground, but it is good in any Blue-White Skies deck because it's still, even if you're not giving flying to the other creature, you're at least pumping it for a turn, which is pretty nice on top of a 2-2 flying body. Um, Shoreline Ranger is next, and I would say it isn't always going to be playable. Um, the fact that it has island cycling is nice. You know, it does give it a little bit of utility in the early game, at least, unlike most six mana 3-4 flyers. But it just doesn't isn't very good in the late game. I mean, Sarah Angel outclasses it by a lot, and it costs one mana less. Um, Jetting Glass Kite costs the same and outclasses it by a lot. So it's not exactly what you want in your deck. Um, if you are splashing or something like that and you want to be able to cut one of your islands, then running Shoreline Ranger isn't the worst thing in the world, um, but I don't love it either. Um, next, we have Wonder, but I think it's actually at its best in decks that can easily get into the graveyard and in decks that don't already have tons of flyers. Um, but it is a 4-mana 2-2 flyer with some upside, so it has that going for it. And I have listed here Field of Souls once again. I think it could potentially be good in this deck because it replaces your flyers who die with even more flyers. And if you have things like Thunderclap Wyvern, um, and the uh, fairy that pumps your, your flying creatures as well. I think Field of Souls becomes very good in this deck. Um, I'm not completely certain about that, though. Uh, you may notice I left one common off of this list, but that is because it is kind of complicated and difficult to rank with these cards, which are all good no matter how many copies you have. So let's talk about Squadron Hawk. Squadron Hawk is a great card, but how good it is depends on how many you manage to get. If you only have one Squadron Hawk, don't play it, not even in this deck. However, if you have two or more, it scales how good it is. Once you have two of these Hawks, they're probably better than everything below even Rift Watcher uh, that we were just looking at. And if you end up with four or more, as well as some of the Anthem effects for creatures with flying, they probably surpass both the Angels and the Glass Kite, because if you have Thunderclap Wyvern in play, and you've just searched for three Squadron Hawks, and you just played another one, things start to get pretty ridiculous. You have a, a massive army of flyers that's difficult for your opponent to deal with. So if you feel like this deck is open, grab as many Squadron Hawks as you can because the card advantage is ridiculous. It helps you go incredibly wide, uh, which is exactly what Thunderclap Wyvern wants to be able to do. So that's why I didn't put Squadron Hawk on the list because it's either unplayable if you only have one or amazing once you get more than one. All right, so... Let's talk about another important aspect of Blue-White Skies deck, and that is blockers. A good Blue-White Skies deck can also clog up the ground, so you are taking less damage than your opponent is in the air, making sure you win your race. Uh, there are three good cards in white and blue that seem to be at their best in this archetype because of their high toughness. Wall of Omens, I think, is the best of the bunch because it draws you a card while also being a good blocker. Glacial Wall is a complete chore for your opponent to take down, and Giant Tortoise will basically always be a 2-mana 1-4 in this deck, making him pretty solid, though I think you play Wall of Omens and Glacial Wall over him most of the time. Um, but the Tortoise he does get the, get the job done on the ground as well if you can't get your hands on the others. So there's also a few rares that go well in this deck. One of them is Karmic Guide, although it goes well in any white deck because it allows you to reanimate something from your graveyard. Also has protection from black and flying, and the downside of Echo, but it's not much of a downside when you bring another creature back. Uh, there's also Serendee Befreet, who has to be one of the most underwhelming rares in this format. Um, <laughs> you know, he's a 3-mana three 3-4 three, with flying, which, you know, is a good rate, but he does one damage to you at your upkeep. It's, you know, as a, usually with rares, he's like an old-school feeling rare, which I guess is what they're going for with Eternal Masters. In terms of, like, more recent rares, he's not all that impressive. I could even see him being an uncommon in some places. Uh, but he's fine in this deck. He won't be hard for you to get, and he, you know, he'll take it. Brago King Eternal is the last card that's, you know, meant for this deck, especially because it's in the same two-color combination, and it flies. 
Um, but he has a little more synergy than that even, because there are Enter the Battlefield abilities within this deck, like uh, Wall of Omens and Peregrine Drake. Peregrine Drake's the one you can really abuse, because you can not have to play him over and over again and keep getting mana back. Um, you can also abuse various other Enter the Battlefield abilities within these colors. I guess Karmic Guide, if you have that as well. Um, on top of that, he's a 4-mana 2-4 flyer, which is always playable anyway. So that does it for the Blue-White Skies deck, the Thunderclap Wyvern deck. We'll move on from there to the next archetype, which is Green-Black Elves. This is the only tribal archetype in Eternal Masters, and we have another signed prose reprint from Magic Origins. This time it's Shaman of the Pack, who was quite the powerhouse there and looks to be very strong here as well, if not probably stronger, because obviously the cards in Eternal Masters on average are going to be stronger than they are in a normal set. Um, Shaman of the Pack is obviously a huge incentive to play tons of elves, and there are several other incentives at common and uncommon to play elves, too. I think all of these are somewhat close to one another in strength, as they provide different benefits to someone playing a lot of elves, so I didn't have them in any particular order. Uh, first, we have Elvish Vanguard there on the left, who becomes an absolute monster if he's allowed to live in an elf deck that really got there. Lissalana Scarblade provides some sweet removal, although it is a very fragile card. Um, but it does allow you to kill things in a way that is pretty efficient because you don't actually have to pay any mana a lot of the time. You do have to give up a card, but it's usually worth it. Um, Lissalana Huntsmaster helps you go wide and synergize as well with all the other elf payoffs by further pumping Elvish Vanguard, making Lissalana Scarblade and Timberwatch, more, more, Timberwatch Elf more potent. And that's a pretty big uh, deal. So Lissalana Huntsmaster might, I guess, be the most important of these in a way because she sort of glues the rest of them together very effectively and helps you go really wide. Um, Timberwatch Elf makes combat an absolute nightmare for your opponent if you have enough elves in play. They just basically can't, you know, they either have to choose between blocking and losing a creature because chances are they're not going to be able to rumble with whatever you're attacking with if you have Timberwatch in play and three or four elves in play. Um, or they just have to take a bunch of damage. Um, it also makes it hard for them to attack if, if you uh, keep your Timberwatch Elf untapped. Finally, Wirewood Symbiote allows you to pull off all kinds of shenanigans, such as using Elisalana Scarblade or Timberwatch Elf twice in one turn, or helping Mana Elves produce more mana, or just protecting some of your Elves from removal. It also synergizes well with Elvish Vanguard and the Huntsmaster, as it allows you to hit their triggers even more frequently. So, that does it for the payoffs, but there are also a ton of elves in the format who don't have any synergistic elf abilities themselves, but make all of the elf cards we just talked about better, if you can get them into your deck. Most of the elves they printed are pretty playable, and I have them listed here in order of how highly I would take them. First, we have Eyeblight's Ending. Um, it's, Eyeblight's Ending is interesting because it's, in general, a first pickable card, but it's also a kind of pseudo payoff for this deck, in that many of your creatures can't be targeted by one of your best removal spells, by one of the best removal spells in the format. So it's kind of a payoff in the sense that you get to dodge Eyeblight's Ending, but it's also worth noting that it is capable of triggering, triggering Lissalana Huntsmasters. You get an elf token and kill their creature. It doesn't do anything else with any of the other elf cards, although I guess you can discard it to Lissalana Scarblade. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, though, because chances are just playing your Eyeblight's Ending is better. I guess maybe if they have an elf, you can use your Lissalana Scarblade to discard Eyeblight's Ending. I'm sure it'll happen at some point. Uh, next on the list, we have Lionel Elves, you know, one of the best commons in the set. Ramps you. It's an elf. It does everything you want to do in this deck. Civic Wayfinder draws you a card, even if it's only a land. That is card advantage, and it can help you splash, which is sometimes important. Uh, Thornwheeled Archer trades with everything, even if it flies. Not something that's always true about Death Touchers. Blight Soil Druid does a bad Lana Where Elves impression, but it's still pretty solid. Deadbridge Shaman can frequently be a two for one, which is nice because it can trade for something with, you know, three toughness or less, and then make your opponent discard a card. Plague Witch is probably the least playable of uh, elves at the uh, common and uncommon, and it's probably better in the reanimator decks that we'll talk about later in this video than it is in this one. But she could make the cut sometimes and isn't a bad sideboard card against a lot of X1s. So there's also a few rares that are at their best in this deck. The first two of these are obvious. One of them helps you ramp and does so with the more elves you have. And the other is a lord that makes elf tokens. Regal Force is also good for the deck because it obviously, this deck obviously can go very wide and will draw you tons of cards. Elves also help you ramp into him. So that does it for the green-black elf archetype. So let's move on to the next one. Next we have red-white aggro slash tokens slash go wide slash a bunch of stuff. Uh, this is a pretty classic red-white archetype, and Flamekin Zealot, which is our signpost com uncommon, does a good job of representing that. The Zealot is at its best when you have an army of creatures in play, and the red-white deck this time around also has a token sub-theme that makes it pretty easy for you to build that army, as well as cheap, efficient creatures. 
We also have a bit of a signpost common and a signpost rare in this color pair, something not all of the color pairs can boast. Rally the Peasants uh, is, you know, it's not a gold card technically, but it has a white cost and then it has a red flashback cost, making it, you know, slide right into this deck. Makes you want to play as a ton of creatures so that Rally the Peasants has a huge effect. I mean, if you have six mana in play, the, the crazy thing about Rally the Peasants is if you have six mana on tap and you attack with like seven creatures and for some reason your opponent takes it, they're usually just going to be dead. Even if you just attack with fewer than that and they decide to take it, because that's plus four, plus zero to your whole team. That's something you should keep in mind when you're playing against this deck as well as uh, when you're playing with the deck. Um, Goblin Trenches, which is a rare also, you know, but it's in this specific color pair, also nudges you towards a token strategy by giving you two red Goblin Soldier Creature tokens for every land you have if, if you want to, as well as pay two mana. Compared to the other archetypes we looked at, this one isn't exactly dripping with huge synergies and interesting card interactions. It is just about playing tons of creatures, generating tokens, and turning your cards sideways until your opponent is dead. In addition to these three cards, though, there are a few others that incentivize you having a lot of creatures in play, and we'll talk about them first. Um, I have this in order of how strong they are in this archetype, where your chief aim is playing as many creatures as possible. Intangible Virtue has the highest ceiling of any of these three cards, but if you end up with enough cards that make tokens... Uh, some of which we'll look at in a moment, it can be incredibly powerful. But you're not always going to get there. Um, there just aren't enough token generators to actually make an intangible virtue deck unless you get very lucky in this in this format. But I think it can slide into this deck sometimes if you get enough token generators, which, is, like I said, we'll talk about in a moment. Orcish Oriflam is an okay card in any version of the deck, though you would rather just have Flamekin Zealots or Rally the Peasants for a considerably better version of this effect. Battle Squadron seems like it could be good in versions of the deck that really get there, but has some pretty big weaknesses, like being terrible unless you have at least two other creatures in play, but in a good version of the deck that shouldn't happen to him too often. So it's a card you'll play if you really get there on this deck, I think, but it's also not one you really have. Neither of these, Orcish Oriflam or Battle Squadron, are probably not Intangible Virtue either, are cards you really have to seek out. Um, they'll probably be around late if you're really in this archetype assuming no one else is in it as well and if you're taking all the good cards for it they probably aren't so uh now we'll talk about cards that help you go wide um beetleback chief is probably the best common or, or, or uncommon red creature in the format and provides three bodies with four total power and toughness which is amazing in this deck I mean, we talked about you know flamekin zealot and rally the peasants which really just punish people if you have a ton of creatures in play he's a one-man army that makes those cards crazy um, Mog War Marshal is another goblin who brings friends with him, bringing a 1-1 goblin when he comes into play when he die, and one when he dies. Uh, and Raise the Alarm is always a good card, providing you two bodies for one card, and it can do it at instant speed, which is sometimes a nice bonus. This color combination also has two Collect Them All creatures, which is no coincidence because these also help you go wide. Squadron Hawk, like in the Blue White Skies deck, scales depending on how many you get, but as long as you have at least two, you're going to want to be playing it. Avarax isn't quite as good, mostly just because he is clunkier. But you probably wouldn't mind playing two of them in most versions of the deck, since playing one and having another one ready to go in the next turn is actually pretty strong and limited. If you think about it in Constructed, you're like, yeah, it's just Avarax. But, you know, if you and your opponent are in top deck mode and you're like, Avarax, grab another Avarax, and then you play the next one, you probably just won. For, you know, you broke parity with your two Avaraxes, most likely, because they are, you know, you know, they're clunky five mana three threes with haste, but... They can get plus one, plus zero in some of turns, so they can sometimes really be a big threat for your opponent. They're not amazing. That's why I have them last on this list. But I wouldn't mind playing two of these in most versions of the deck, unless I ended up with, like, I would much rather play all the other cards in front of it, obviously, but if I don't get Aver if I don't get them, Avarex is not the worst, things, worst thing ever. So in addition to going wide, this color pair has the most low-curve aggressive creatures, and that also pairs well with the cards that pay off going wide. Uh, Fervent Cathar. Like more recent cards, Goblin Heel Cutter and Voldaren Duelist, which are similar, is very strong and makes your opponent's best blocker and able to block, which against this deck can be like opening the floodgates. Uh, Calciderm isn't exactly low curve, but he's a great curve topper for a deck that has a low curve. Uh, this deck probably doesn't want things that cost much more than four, than maybe a couple Avaraxes. Um, and it's a very good card. I mean, you know, it's Blastoderm, basically. Uh, that may be an old, too old of a reference for some people, but that's what it was a reference to when it was printed. It was to an even older card called Blastoderm, and Calciderm is a white version of that. It's a 4-mana 5-5 five, five with Shroud and Vanishing 4, which means it eventually disappears, but for those three turns that you can swing with it, it's pretty awesome. Um, so you definitely want to be playing it. If you want to play it in any deck, it's in this one. Um, this is also the best deck for Balinok Cohort, who will usually be a 3-3 first strike in it. Not to mention with all the pump effects and things, it gets even stupider because 
then it's got first strike. And if they did block it and you just use Rally the Peasants, you know, you just destroyed their board with, you know, your other creatures as well and your cohort survives. And then I have an interesting card and his white main line. It may look a little weird here, but he's actually pretty good in the deck. He is a 2-2 for 2 who can bounce creatures to protect them or allow you to use their inner to battlefield ability again. And there are several good ones in this deck. Fervent Cathar, Beetleback Chief, and Mog War Marshal are all better if you can use their abilities multiple times. It also works well with Calciderm because you can get him back in your hand before he loses his last fading counter. Notice white mate lion, the white main lion does not say return target creature you control to its owner's hand. It says return a creature. So you can actually t target Calciderm with it and, you know, sort of restart your Calciderm, which is not something your opponent's going to want to be dealing with. Um, there are more of these on this list as well. For example, Keldon Marauders, uh, our next card, which is nice as a two mana three, three. It is also nice though, because it can do two damage even in the late game if it can't swing, but it also works decently with white main lion because you can bounce it and get the, an additional damage and keep your Keldon Marauders around longer. Notice it says leaves the battlefield, not dies. So bouncing it will also do one damage to your opponent. Um, Get to Slinger can knock a blocker out of the way at an efficient rate, even if you don't want to pay Echo or burn the opponent for the last two damage. And again, White Main Lion's perfectly happy to bounce and get to Slinger as well and be able to burn the opponent or one of their creatures again. Um, and this is one of the best decks for core Hookmaster 2, who can get a block out of the way almost as well as Fervent Cathar and thus open the floodgates on your opponent. Borderland Marauder is effectively a 2-mana 3-2 in this deck because you're always going to be wanting to turn it sideways. Keldon Champion is pretty sweet, although I wouldn't really want, want more than one because they're kind of costly with the echo cost. And it can finish an opponent out of nowhere, though, because it itself can represent six damage on top of whatever else you're doing. Um, and finally, we have Mog Fanatic, who's a one mana, one one in the early game, who, you know, that's great for your cards that pump your whole team. It's also great uh, because in the later game, it can do one damage to the opponent or kill, help kill one of their creatures. This deck's main goals, as I said, are just to play a bunch of low-curve creatures and smash through the opponent's defensives to do a massive amount of damage. I see it as being very capable of doing that. Um, but let's talk about a few rares who are at their best in this deck, and then we're finished up with red-white. So in addition to Goblin Trenches, which I mentioned at the beginning of our discussion of this archetype, there is another Goblin rare that is very good in this archetype. Uh, and is indeed first pickable much of the time, Siege Gang Commander. He is like Beetleback Chief on steroids, giving you five power over four bodies for five mana, and then having the ability to chuck goblins, which this deck has a lot of, at the opponent or their creatures. Sulfuric Vortex will also be at its best in this deck, and is also potentially a first pickable card, as it is the most aggressive deck in the format, and the Vortex can help finish the game for you, even if your opponent stabilizes. All right, so that does it for red-white. Let's move on to the next archetype. Next, we have blue-red spells matter. As many of the archetypes are classic archetypes for that specific color pair, so too is blue-red, which is spells matter, slash flashback, as you can see. Um, you blue-red typically have some of the most efficient, powerful spells in a limited format, and there are a few cards that synergize well with all of those instant sorcery spells. In Eternal Masters, blue-red has the most cards with flashback as well, as our signpost common desperate raving shows us. Again, this is a strange color pair where we not only have we Dragonauts is our signpost uncommon, which makes it obvious you want to be playing a lot of spells because it can be swinging for up to three a turn, which it can do in a good version of this deck. Um, but also Desperate Ravings, which is another card with flashback that lets you know that these two colors go together and they want to be doing things with the graveyard to a degree and with spells. And Desperate Ravings lets you do both of those things. Um, if the deck gets there, the We Dragonauts will be very strong and Desperate Ravings will also be good. And I'll explain why flashback can be so good in this format. Um, for this deck to be at its strongest, I think it ends up being a blue-red deck primarily built around one of the funnest limited build-around cards of all time, Burning Vengeance. It can obviously also get there with the help of Young Pyromancer, but the Pyromancer fits into a Burning Vengeance deck as well, since it gives you an elemental token every time you play a spell from the graveyard or otherwise. So I think Burning Vengeance, I think the best versions of this deck you'll ever see will have at least one Burning Vengeance in them, just because the card is so good. In addition to being fun, it's also very good because it lets you kill creatures, lets you kill your opponent. If you have enough flashback cards, and blue-red do have a ton of them. We've already seen one, for example. Um, Quiet Speculation is also quite powerful. The other uncommon they printed for this sort of pair of flashback uh, build-arounds um, because it lets you tutor up whatever you want and throw it in your graveyard, and then if you have Burning Vengeance in play, things just get ridiculous. Um, this may make the deck one of those archetypes that is sweet when it really comes together, but most of the time just doesn't get, get there since there are uh, so many of the key cards are uncommons. 
Obviously, though, any good instants and sorceries fit well into this deck because they power both Young Pyromancer and Wee Dragonauts. Counterspell and Memory Lapse both thrive with Young Pyromancer, as does Brainstorm. But we're going to focus on the cards you really want to really make this flashback deck a thing. Uh, though it is important to note that after you have a couple of Dragonauts and Pyromancers, you should just basically take every playable instant sorcery spell you see, uh, not just the ones that have flashback or retrace, by the way. It's not just about flashback on Burning Vengeance. You'll note it says, cast from your graveyard, not cast with the flashback cost. So this is a listing of all the cards with flashback in these two colors in order of how powerful I think they will be in Eternal Masters. Flashback or retrace, I should say. Firebolt is number one. It's very strong, able to kill a creature or burn an opponent, and then again from the graveyard. Silent Departure buys you time to find your Burning Vengeance and then can bounce stuff later too. Deep Analysis is an amazing card that can draw you a ton of cards, you know, uh, for six mana and three life, basically. You net four cards, which is a rate people would be willing to pay, but you actually get to pay it over two installments, which I think makes it even better. Um, Flame Jab is probably one of the better win conditions for the deck, because cards with Retrace don't get exiled like cards with Flashback do, so using Flame Jab over and over with Vengeance in play is pretty awesome. Uh, Faithless Looting helps you dig for Vengeance, uh, and helps you throw cards with Flashback or Retrace in your graveyard. Reckless Charge is always, only going to be good in a deck that also has We Dragonauts or other Flyers, but there it is. it will be good and benefit from Burning Vengeance too. Una's Grace is the other card with Retrace, and it's kind of a bad card draw spell, but if you don't get Flame Jab, it offers another endless source of damage. And finally, Dream Twist I don't think is actually here for this deck. I just want to point it out so people aren't running it. I think it's actually more here for the Reanimator deck, uh, which is a blue-black deck. Um, but maybe it can work out in this deck too. If you throw enough cards with, re with Flashback into your graveyard with it uh, and just sort of keep the train running with, with your... Uh, Burning Vengeance, then it gets to be pretty good. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it can fit into this deck, but I do think it's probably better in the Reanimator deck. So this is how you want to try to get these cards in your graveyard. Um, in addition to casting them, they're the best ways to do it. We, we also saw some other cards that let you discard cards like Faithless Looting, which also has flashback, so it's even better for this deck. But Factor Fiction and Merfolk Looter are both good ways of throwing cards into your graveyard. Um, Factor Fiction is just a great card in general. It's going to net you several cards one way or another. And if your opponent's playing against you and you reveal like three flashback cards and two lands, your opponent just wants to face palm probably. And Merfolk Looter is great because it helps you draw into your Burning Vengeance while also allowing you to um, discard flashback cards or whatever else you want to discard. Um, I do want to say that if you can find a way to splash, Roar of the Worm is a pretty big payoff for splashing green. Uh, it's amazing in this deck because you can tutor it with Quiet Speculation and then have a 6-6 Worm on turn four. Obviously, that's the ideal situation. But even if you can't, you know, tutor for it and do that, it's still a pretty strong card to splash. Um, you know, it gives you a lot of value. I mean, a 7-mana 6-6 and then a 4-mana 6-6 is still a pretty good rate. Um, but obviously, it's better if you can get it into your graveyard. But, you know, Merfolk Looter can help with that as well. So here's a few rares that work at their best in this deck. One of them is Mystical Tutor. It lets you search for whatever it is you need, including Quiet Speculation, which is probably going to be a popular target for it, uh, thing for it to target. It can also find, you know, again, anything else you need. Uh, Dual Caster Mage is good because it lets you copy your spells, and you're going to be playing a lot of spells. And there's also one rare card with Retrace, and it's obviously more of a threat than any of the other two we talked about because it keeps giving you a 5-5 five, five blue and red elemental creature token with flying every turn um, if you're discarding a land for it every turn, um, and that's a pretty good value. Plus, if you have Burning Vengeance in play, you're also doing two damage to your opponent at the same time. So pretty heinous, uh, but it's pretty sweet as well. So next we go to Blue-Green. Um, blue green is notoriously ill defined in draft formats and the supposed signpost uncommons are often head scratcher head scratchers in fact shadows over innistrad is one of the few formats where blue green had like a clearly defined and unique archetype and unfortunately in this set in eternal masters it's not super clear from the signpost uncommon what blue green should be doing don't get me wrong trigon predator which you see here is a good card a three mana two three flyer is a great rate and it gives added value by making artifact by nuking artifacts rather and enchantment sometimes so as usual blue green is sort of a good stuff deck but through examining and looking at the commons and uncommons in these two colors there's another small theme that pops up on its creatures i don't know why they didn't put it on their signpost uncommon they could have easily but they didn't um and that theme is threshold uh, maybe they thought it would be too strong if they did i don't know so these are cards with threshold it's an old mechanic from odyssey block sort of similar to delirium now only you need to get seven cards in your graveyard and they can be of any card type and then you get a bonus 
Green got two very powerful common creatures with Threshold that incentivize uh, getting Threshold a great deal. If you can get multiple copies of both of these, you probably want to force Threshold pretty hard uh, because they are amazing. Um, Werebear and Nimble Mongoose are incredibly good cards. I was surprised that they're both at common um, because they, if you can get Threshold, they're crazy. You know, a 3-3 with Shroud and a 4-4 uh, who can add mana too if you need that are both very good. If you can get Threshold quickly, it's very scary. There's also an uncommon green card with Threshold, as you can see. But I actually think he's not as good as Nimble Mongoose or Werebear, although he is... You know, green occasionally has haste, and Centaur Chieftain's an example of that, and he does pump your whole team and give them trample. And then there's also a blue card uh, with Threshold at common. It's not as good as any of the green ones, I don't think, really. Um, but it's pretty good. Uh, it would be better if it did what it did to help you get Threshold, because it lets you draw three cards and discard two cards. And doing that for four mana is a pretty good deal. And by the way, you know, this deck can also have cards with uh, flashback in it because there's several blue cards so discarding them and getting them in the graveyard gives you some value as well so these are the cards of threshold that you really want to be playing you can easily get multiple copies of werebear and nimble mongoose and really get there on a sweet threshold deck um, but there's another thing going on with the graveyard that further incentivizes you trying to throw cards into your graveyard and that is incarnations um, these are a really good sign that this color pair is supposed to be really interested in the graveyard um, in addition to Threshold because incarnations, when they were originally printed, were actually a five-card cycle, one in each color. You know, you had Anger, you know, you had all the other ones like that. Um, but this, in this set, there's only, in Eternal Masters, there's only Wonder and there's only Brawn. There's only those two, um, indicating that Blue Green wants to be throwing these guys in the graveyard. And indeed, Wonder, the idea of Wonder with a Werebear and nimble mongoose in play is amazing if i can get wonder in my graveyard and have them both in play a 3-3 shroud flyer is is awesome um just the idea of having that makes me want to try to draft this deck um now that we sort of talked about sort of the graveyard payoffs which are the threshold cards and the two incarnations uh we'll talk about how to get cards in the graveyard in these two colors um, there are commons and uncommons that help you hit threshold. Uh, Factor Fiction, Merfolk Looter, which we talked about a moment ago, are always good cards, but they're especially so in this deck because they help you hit threshold. Screeching Scob gives you an early start on threshold, in addition to a decent two-drop who does, you know, can attack or block or whatever in the early game, and making it so you get three cards in your graveyard, really. Um, but the best threshold enabler in the set at common or uncommon might be with Commune with the Gods because on its own, it can actually get you six of seven cards in the graveyard if you choose not to get anything, but it gives you five of seven even if you take something, which is pretty sweet for getting threshold, especially if you're, like, grabbing your nimble mongoose. You know, it reminds me of when people would cast Commune with the Gods and then grab the, um, the Hooting Mandrels out of the pile and then put the rest in their graveyard and then cast Hooting Mandrels. That's kind of what uh, the mongoose is like in a way, or the werebear, either one of them, if you grab it with Commune with the Gods. So... Uh, other ways of getting threshold um, are Milliken, which also helps you ramp, by the way, but it also throws cards in your graveyard, which is nice. Um, and that's, I guess, the only other way of helping you get threshold. Um, there's also one rare printed in a specific color pair, and it's a strong one. It's Shardless Agent. I think it's probably not a coincidence that it can hit Blurred Mongoose or Werebear for you. And if you have threshold turn on when you do, that's some pretty crazy value. Uh, there aren't really any other rares especially suited for this deck, though obviously big bomby green creatures like Silvos Rogue Elemental are pretty nice in any deck. The next archetype we'll look at is Blue Black, where the signpost uncommon is Extract from Darkness, which makes you and your opponent both mill the top two cards of your library, and then you get to return a creature card from either graveyard to your battlefield under your control, which is pretty nice. Um, it's actually a pretty cool card for Commander, incidentally. I didn't really know it existed before they re reprinted it here, um, but it's pretty cool for Commander, but that's not what we're talking about here. Talking about it as the signpost uncommon. Um, it's pretty powerful, although I think it's actually weaker than a lot of the other signpost uncommons, especially because there are other good ways in black to reanimate things. But the point is that it shows us we want to be throwing cards in our graveyard and we want to be reanimating stuff in this archetype. And that is what this archetype wants to do. Um, so we have Extract from Darkness as a reanimator spell, but there are also three other uncommon spells that black has access to that can help it reanimate things. Uh, and they are Torrent of Souls, Animate Dead, and Victimize. Um, I don't actually have these in order of how good they think they are. They're kind of in, no, well, not in reverse order even, but Torrent of Souls is the worst of these for sure. It's obviously better in the Black Red deck, which has a little bit of a reanimation sub-theme, and actually it's the Black Red signpost uncommon that we'll talk about. Um, 
if you can pay for both costs, then it's even better. You know, if you get black and red mana into it. So if you're splashing one of those, it gets even better because it gives whatever you give back, bring back haste and plus two plus zero that turn. But animate dead and victimize are better. They're both very cheap ways to bring things back. Animate dead is highly um, efficient because for two mana, you get to bring back a creature from either graveyard. Once again, by the way, usually your graveyard is going to be better if you get there on this deck. But from either graveyard, you get to bring a creature back. It does get minus one, minus zero. And if Animate Dead gets blown up some way or another, your creature also dies. But that's not the biggest setback. Um, and it's an amazing way to reanimate creatures. And then there's also Victimize, which does require you to have another creature in play um, to sacrifice. But you lose one creature and you get two creatures back from your graveyard. If you're really getting there on this deck, Victimize is going to make, have some big blowout turns uh, because you can bring back two amazing creatures from your graveyard uh, very easily with Victimize. Um, so that's sort of the reanimation suite that Black has access to. It's important to note that they're all uncommon and you don't have super easy access to them. But people, most, a lot of other decks aren't going to be that interested in Victimize um, or probably not Animate Dead either. So you do have access to those. Definitely not the blue-black uncommon. Um, but... So, you know, they're powerful cards, but not everyone's going to be looking at them, and the reanimation deck can have the most fun with them for sure. So one of the requirements of reanimation deck is having a way to get stuff into your graveyard easily. The best way to do this is with controlled discard rather than milling yourself, and there are several ways in blue and black to discard things. Um, one of them is Plague Witch, which we talked about briefly with the elf deck. It's definitely better here, um, you know. It's a, a small, fragile creature, but it is a discard outlet that can also function as removal or function as a combat trick that sort of wreaks havoc on the, on the table in the early going of the game. And I think that makes Plague Witch pretty sweet um, in this deck because you can discard, you know, your reanimation target and, you know, also kill a creature at the same time. That's pretty good value. Uh, there's also Cephalid Sage we talked about in the Threshold deck. Obviously, if you're in this deck, you can get Threshold somewhat easily. Maybe not as easy as Boo Green, but you can get it because you can throw stuff in your graveyard. Some of the same cards that for filling your graveyard to get Threshold in Blue Green can also be played here. The blue ones, like Screeching Scob, things like that. Um, and Cephalid Sage, if you have her online, is a very good outlet for discarding reanimation targets because it draws you deeper into your deck and allows you to discard two cards. So you're getting closer to your reanimation target, your reanimation spell, and choosing what you discard, which is very important. There's also Merfolk Looter, probably the best way of discarding uh, at common or uncommon anyway, because for two mana, uh, you get 1-1, one, one, but it's also a looter, which means you can tap it and draw cards, discard cards. Um, so it digs you deeper into your deck the same way Cephalid Sage can, but it's repeatable. Um, and so you can keep your reanimation spell and discard your reanimation target and eventually just get there on reanimating something sweet from your graveyard. Mindless Automaton, another uncommon uh, discard outlet. Not an amazing one. It does cost you one mana. He does get bigger when you discard stuff, so it's not completely irrelevant. And he can even draw you cards if he gets enough plus one, plus one counters on him. Um, there's also Factor Fiction, but there's sort of a word of caution about this one. If you don't have either your reanimation spell or your reanimation target and you cast Factor Fiction... Um, and you hit, hit both of them, a smart opponent will put both in the same pile, which will sort of ruin your day. If you already have either a creature in your graveyard or a reanimation spell in your hand, you can be a little, you know, you can get away with it. But if you don't have one or the other in your hand already, fact or fiction, uh, against a, it's an opponent who understands what's going on can actually hurt you a little bit. But it is good uh, in this deck most of the time. Um, there's also ways to just mill yourself, like Dream Twist and Screeching Scowl, which I mentioned. And I don't love them um, because you don't know what you're going to hit as well. You can't choose what goes into your graveyard the way you can with looting or discarding like Plague Witch. Um, but it does, you know, if you have enough reanimation targets in your deck that you feel comfortable with Dream Twist, you should go for it, I guess, because it definitely can fill your graveyard. Um, so now we're going to talk about the reanimation targets at Common and Uncommon. Um, some of them are huge monsters. Some of them have sweet into the battlefield abilities that you don't mind getting more than once. And some of them have both. Um, so Phyrexian Ingester is, I think, the best uh, reanimation target at common or uncommon for the black-blue deck. It is incredibly strong um, if you can reanimate it. It's kind of clunky if you're trying to hard cast it. If you can, you're pretty happy, though, because you can reanimate this thing for, you know, two mana, as little as two mana or as little as three mana, and remove your opponent's best creature, and your Ingester also gets pl power and toughness plus X plus Y equal to the exiled creature's power and toughness. So it's absolutely massive. And this is an uncommon, which is amazing to me. Um, but I think they put it there as a key reanimation target because they had to have some at common and uncommon. And I think Phyrexian Ingester is the best thing you want to reanimate. 
Um, another decent reanimation target is Jetting Glass Kite. I don't love it as much as I love Phyrexian and Jester, but if you can get this back in the early going of the game, like get it out there on turn three or four, your opponent's going to have a hard time dealing with it. There is also Havoc Demon, who's a huge monster you can bring back from your graveyard, who also has the added bonus, or you know, it could hurt you too if you're not careful, of if your opponent ever does deal with it, probably killing all their creatures. Um, so in certain situations, you definitely want to be reanimating that. There's also Phyrexian Gargantua, who's a fun card to reanimate because of its sweet ability that draws you two cards, and you do lose two life at the same time, in addition to a decent body. And there's also Necrotal, who's a card that you like to reanimate. You know, if you've already gotten one use out of him and he's killed something and then traded for something else, you've got one two for one, and if you can bring him back and do it again, then why not? So those, But those are the only really good reanimation targets um, at common or uncommon for blue and black for the most part. Um, I wish they'd put a few more in there. You basically have to hit either like get multiple Phyrexian ingesters, which is possible. Um, if you get that, do that, then you're golden. But you either have to you have to hit some of the rares as well to have a uh, the most effective reanimation deck possible. Um, and these are some examples of the rares that you really want to be reanimating, especially Sphinx of the Steel Wind and Inkwell Leviathan. I think they're the, the two that you want to bring back the most. They're both incredibly difficult to deal with. Sphinx of the Steel Wind can just win you the game on its own because the lifelink and vigilance make it impossible to race. It has first strike and flying too. Um, it has protection from red and from green, which are two key colors. Um, although green, not so much. But red, you know, it does dodge certain removal spells. Equal Leviathan has Shroud, Island Walk, and Trample. It's very difficult to deal with. But you don't also don't mind picking up Vasara the Dreadful, who's just, you know... Uh, a kill spell on a stick who opens also happens to be a six mana five five flyer and you also don't mind duplicate although i actually think phyrexian ingester is better in this deck um, because duplicate doesn't get plus x plus y added to his power and toughness he just takes on power and toughness of the creature he kills but he does have a powerful enter the battlefield ability that you don't mind getting to trigger more than once if you reanimate him for example um there are others that aren't exactly in blue and black. Obviously, Sphinx of the Steel Wind isn't exactly either, but you can, you know, splash a little bit of white just in case you have to hard cast it. But there are other good reanimation targets in other colors. Uh, Jareth Leonine Titan's not bad. I think you have to be splashing white to really take advantage of him, though, because his protection ability is what really makes him great. He can block forever, but he can also hit pretty hard, not amazingly hard with four power. There's also Crater Hellion, who is an absolute amazing spell to bring back um, because you can completely wipe the board when you bring it back. Um, and that's pretty amazing. You don't have to pay the echo again on your next upkeep, but you don't necessarily have to. You can keep reanimating him if you want and keep doing four damage. But uh, if you really get there on this deck, that would be a lot of fun. But it is it is an amazing card to be able to reanimate. Um, and for him, you don't need to be running any... I mean, you have to have red in your deck to pay the echo, but if you can reanimate him and get his effect, sometimes that's enough. Um, there's also Rorix Bladewing, who you definitely, if you want to hard cast him... It's probably impossible in these decks, but he's pretty great to bring back because he has a pretty quick clock. If you can animate Dead Rorix Bladewing on turn three, which is possible with this deck, uh, your opponent's in for a bad day because they're taking five that turn and they'll be dead in a few more turns. Um, and Silvos Rogue Elemental is another good target, although you also, this time, you prefer to be splashing green so you can regenerate him. I think of the off-color ones, Rorix is probably the best, but those are all cards worth thinking about being able to reanimate. There's also some other cards with graveyard value uh, in this format where you know you don't mind you don't mind having to discard things or whatever because you can get them back later or you get value out of them. We saw Wonder um, already when we talked about Blue Green Threshold, probably at its best in Blue Green Threshold. But being able to give one of your monsters that you bring back from the graveyard, like your Frexian and Jester, flying is pretty amazing. And Wonder can really do that for you if you get it into your graveyard, which isn't that hard with this deck. Gravedigger can bring back, you know, utility creatures from the graveyard. Urborg Uprising isn't amazing, but, you know, it gives you a fairly large amount of card advantage. It is clunky. You don't impact the board immediately, but you're basically drawing three cards with Urborg Uprising. Five mana, draw three cards is pretty strong, um, but it is a little bit clunky. There's also a few rares that go well into this deck. If you can pick up an Entomb, uh, you are golden because that's the easiest way there is to throw your Sphinx of the Steel Wind into your graveyard or, you know... If you don't get the Mythic to get your Phyrexian Ingester into your graveyard and reanimate it early. Icarid, you know, I'm not sure it's actually going to get there in this format. I don't know that you're going to be able to get enough black creature cards in your graveyard that you want to exile to really take advantage of Icarid. But if any deck can do it, it's probably this one. And then Baleful Strix is just in these colors. 
it's a great card. It's an easy two for one because it draws you a card and then it kills anything it blocks. You can even attack in the air if it has to. So that does it for the blue black reanimation deck. Um, next we have black red sacrifice slash tokens. Um, we already saw Torrent of Souls, and I have to say the signpost comment is a little bit puzzling. Uh, we just touched on it briefly when we talked about blue black reanimator, and I'm fairly certain they decided to print this card because it can serve both decks pretty well. The red black deck can reanimate stuff too if it wants to. It has access to the same reanimation spells that blue black has, and it actually has access to some ways to discard things like um, faithless looting and things like that. But it doesn't have as many good targets at uncommon to reanimate as blue does, like Frexian and Jester and Jetting Glass Kite. Um, but the black, rec black red deck instead has a sacrifice and token sub theme within it, which works well with not only the reanimation aspect, but the plus two plus zero aspect of Torrent, and Souls, Torrent of Souls. However, unlike the red white deck with its tokens, the red black deck ideally wants to use the tokens as fodder for sacrifice effects. So first we'll talk about the various ways to make tokens in this archetype. Um, these are the primary ones. Uh, we got Beetleback Chief, who we've already seen. And Mog War Marshal, we've already seen when talking about red-white tokens. They're both very good cards. They're good in both decks. But Black has a few of its own things to add, like Singer Autocrat, who can give your sacrifice outlets a lot of fuel because it brings three Black Surf Creature tokens with it. It does come with the downside that if it dies, so do all your Surf tokens. And Wake Dancer is very good in this deck. Morbid cards are generally good in a deck that can sacrifice things because you can tr control when the Morbid trigger is going to happen. And she brings you two bodies that can be sacrificed if they need to. So she's very synergistic with the deck's goal in general. Um, now I'm going to talk about a few sacrifice synergies um, that are things you really want to be able to do in this deck if you're really going to get there on making a black-red sacrifice deck. I think the biggest key card is sort of a build-around uncommon, and that is Blood Artist. Um, this thing is absolute murder. The more you have, the worse they get. I mean, it's, um, it is an amazing card. It's sort of like Zulaport Cutthroat, which we had recently if you're a new, newer player, except it affects all creatures on both sides of the board dying. Um, so if you can control sacrificing things and can, you, when you kill your opponent's things as well, you get to drain them, it becomes very good. And luckily, there are some free or cheap ways to sacrifice things in this format. Chief among them, I think, is Carrion Feeder, who can itself turn into an amazing win condition. If it eats enough, you know, surf tokens or goblin tokens, it becomes a very, you know, you have to kill it very quickly. And if at the same time you're draining them with Blood Artist, you're getting a pretty good clock. Le less good is Wake of Vultures. Um, but it is a 4-mana 3-1 that can regenerate, and it has eva an evasive ability in flying. It's 4-mana 3-1s of flying are usually playable and limited, although this format is probably a little stronger than usual. But I still think this is playable um, in the sacrifice deck because you want to be sacrificing things. Um, and then there's Tooth and Claw, which is kind of a terrible card. I'm not exactly sure why it's here. But in a world where you get enough Blood Artists and enough uh, other sacrifice outlets... Tooth and Claw is pretty good because it's another free sacrifice outlet like Carrion Feeder. If you have a way to make a bunch of tokens and sacrifice them, Blood Artist quickly kills people, and you're actually getting a creature at the same time who can then also be sacrificed. So you can sort of set up a chain with Tooth and Claw and Carrion Feeder that can just drain your opponent to death, but you do need to have Blood Artist in play for that to really work out. If you don't have Blood Artist, I'd say don't play Tooth and Claw because it's, it's a very weird card. Um, next, there's Dragon Egg, which I think is one of the best things to sacrifice there is. Three mana, zero two with defenders, pretty bad. But when it dies, whether it blocks or whether you sacrifice it to your carrion feeder or your tooth and claw, you get a two two dragon with fire breathing, and that is pretty strong. Um, there's also cabal therapy, which is pretty good in this deck because you're making lots of tokens who can die. Um, you know, if, if on the first time you use cabal therapy, you whiff, you don't hit something you want to. Uh, sacrificing a creature for you usually isn't a big deal because they're either tokens or you have a blood artist in play for extra value. Um, and so, you know, that's pretty good. Or you sacrifice your dragon egg and it just becomes a dragon. And then you get to hit a card in your opponent's hand, maybe two, if they have multiples of a certain card. Um, there's also Deadbridge Shaman, who has a nice kill uh, trigger, which isn't an amazing one. But when it does die, it does force your opponent to discard a card. Um, and that can be good if in conjunction with, you know, Carrion Feeder or Blood Artist or whatever. Um, and then there's also Ashnod's Altar, which is another free discard outlet and one that actually can ramp you, and that is another card that works well with Blood Artist. Uh, cards with Morbid are at their best in this deck because you can control when it sacrifice things. We already mentioned uh, Wake Dancer, but there's also Tragic Slip. Um, I will say that this archetype is super, super dependent on getting Blood Artist. I don't think this archetype can survive as a sacrifice archetype without Blood Artist. I think otherwise it's just a worse version of the blue-black deck because it can't reanimate things as well as the blue-black deck can for the most part, because it can't discard things quite as easily. 
and it can't, doesn't have as good um, common and uncommon reanimation targets. There are some rares in the format that are at the best in this deck. We have Braid's Cabal Minion. If you're making a bunch of tokens, it's really not going to be especially symmetrical, especially if you're blood artisting your opponent or sacrificing dragon eggs to her and just getting a win condition every time. Um, there's also Malicious Affliction, a very good card with Morbid. That becomes a two-for-one if you can Morbid. Um, and Void, which is in this color combination and, you know, is powerful, um, but it is sort of erratic. So it's not a card I, I love a whole lot. I don't think you always play it, but it can be quite good. If you can, if you can Cabal Therapy and then Void, that makes it even better, obviously. So on to the next archetype where we have red-green aggro. This is an archetype similar to the red-white aggro deck we already discussed, but instead of making as many small creatures as possible, this deck focuses on playing powerful undercosted creatures. This color combination is supported by more signpost-type cards than any other, with Bloodbraid Elf probably being the strongest of the bunch because he's absurdly powerful. You know, he's banned and modern for a reason. Um, he's very good. He can, you know, a four mana, three, two with haste. It's already a, you know... It's passable, playable, but when you add on top of that, by the way, I get to cast a spell for free that costs three or less, whichever one I hit first um, is pretty good. Um, you also have Curd Ape, who is at its best if you're playing green. Flint Hoof Boar, who's at its best if you're playing red. And then Giant Solifuge, who can fit into a red deck or a green deck too, but this is obviously the deck that can cast it the most easily. Um, other than these four payoff cards for being in red-green, the red-green deck is basically an assemblage of good red and green creatures, basically all of which have been discussed in various other aggressive archetypes featuring those colors. So there isn't much more to say here, but it is certainly true that you have a pretty powerful deck if you manage to pick up multiples of these signpost cards, um, especially Bloodbraid Elf. Um, but Flint of Boar and Curd Ape in large numbers are also not something to scoff at because they just give you a huge, huge body for a low cost if you can really get there on the lands. So we have one archetype left, if we can, if we can call it an archetype, um, and you'll see what I mean in a second, and that is black-white tokens. Um, and there isn't much to say about it. Uh, black-white seems to me to have the least support of any archetype in the format. The signpost uncommon would indicate that the deck is about going wide one way or the other, because it pumps your whole team, right? And while the deck does have a few ways to make tokens, all of which have been discussed either in the red-white deck or the black-white deck, um, it doesn't have the critical mass of token, not black-white deck, the... We've talked about all the token generators is the point. The, the black-red deck is what I meant to say, or the red-white deck. Those are the two that have talked about token generators. But while the, the deck has a few ways to make tokens, it doesn't have the critical mass that red-white or red-black has. Red is a crucial part of those color pairs that provides some quality cards that make creature tokens. As is frequently the case, black-white does have a ton of good removal, and I guess Zealous Persecution fits in there, so maybe it's supposed to be something of a control deck. I feel like Wizards kind of dropped the ball with this color pair, but that is almost always the case in every format. That one color pair is somewhat neglected, and this time around it looks like it's white-black. If you have another idea for what this color pair does, please enlighten me in the comments below. Um, but basically this is the weakest archetype just because there's not synergy coming out of everywhere like there are in most of the other archetypes. There are, of course, differing levels of synergy depending on what we're talking about, but obviously for our all the other archetypes, except for maybe red-green aggro, you know, there was a lot to talk about in terms of synergy. And black-red, you know, is weak in, in its own way because you have to have Blood Artist probably to really get there with it. But if you have a couple of them, uh, your deck is awesome. So that does it for the archetype overview of Eternal Masters and for my limited review of Eternal Masters in general. I'm pretty excited to draft the format some, although unfortunately I don't think I'll be able to do any on Magic Online unless, unless, and I'm hoping this happens, they extend how long it is available online like they did Modern Masters last year because I'll be without regular internet during, for about three weeks during the period that it's supposed to be on Magic Online, almost exactly the same period, unfortunately. Um, if you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, don't forget to click the like button. Um, did I get any color pairs wrong or leave something important out? Let me know in the comments below. And if you want to make sure you don't miss out on a limited review every time a new set comes out, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching.